Thank you, Doug. And now Phyllis Schlafly. Thank you, Bill, for arranging this platform to discuss uh, the future of the Republican Party and pro-life. I have a great interest in the future of the Republican Party. I've been a Republican volunteer all my life and was an elected delegate to six Republican National Conventions and an elected alternate delegate to two others. Uh, the Republican Party is not a fraternity with a hazing procedure for admission. We impose no ideological or religious tests on anyone who calls himself a Republican, and we invite all Americans to vote for our candidates. We do not demand to know the reasons why people vote for Republican candidates, and there's no space in those little boxes on the ballot to record their reasons. Nevertheless, the Republican Party has a tradition of standing for certain principles, and it has and should have an identity different from the other parties. The Republican Party was born on the principle that no human being should be considered the property of another. That is our heritage as Republicans, and it would be a tragic mistake to abandon that fundamental precept now. The most famous political debates in American history, the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, will be reenacted this year on C-SPAN. During those seven debates up and down the state of Illinois, Abraham Lincoln enunciated the, the position of the then new Republican Party that slavery was a moral, a social, and a political wrong. Stephen A. Douglas took the position that individual states should have freedom of choice to decide this issue for themselves through the democratic process without dictate from the federal government. In Quincy, Illinois, Lincoln argued that we should, quote, deal with slavery as with any other wrong insofar as we can prevent its growing larger and deal with it in that in the run of time there may be some promise of an end of it. We have a due regard for the actual presence of it amongst us and the difficulties of getting rid of it in any satisfactory way, but we must oppose it as an evil, close quote. Where did Lincoln get his authority for saying that slavery was wrong and must be eliminated eventually, if not immediately? It was from our nation's founding document, the Declaration of Independence, which asserts as a self-evident truth that each of us is endowed by their creator with unalienable rights of life and liberty, and that government is instituted for the purpose of securing those rights. Douglas countered with the arguments of choice, states' rights, and opposition to dictation by the federal government. He argued that, quote, each state of this union has a right to do as it pleases on the subject of slavery, close quote. Douglas supported the Dred Scott decision, saying, I choose to abide by the decisions of the Supreme Court as they are pronounced. Lincoln said that he, quote, looks forward to a time when slavery shall be abolished everywhere. Douglas replied, quote, I look forward to a time when each state shall be allowed to do as it pleases. If it chooses to keep slavery forever, it is not my business. But if it chooses to abolish slavery, it, it is its own business, not mine. I care more for the great principle of self-government, close quote. In reporting the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the biased press of the 1830s called Lincoln a dead dog walking to his political grave and reported Douglas's arguments as logical and powerful. Lincoln lost that senatorial election to Douglas, but two years later, Abraham Lincoln was elected our first Republican president, and the verdict of history is that Lincoln's argument was correct. The real issue in this controversy, Lincoln said in the Alton, Illinois debate, is that the Republican Party, quote, looks upon the institution of slavery as a wrong and the Democratic Party does not look upon it as a wrong, close quote. Lincoln proclaimed that the slavery issue represented, quote, the eternal struggle between these two principles, right and wrong, close quote. Abortion is the right or wrong issue of our times. We should parallel the words of Abraham Lincoln today and say the Republican Party looks upon abortion as a wrong, and the Democratic Party does not look upon it as a wrong. That's the crucial difference between the two parties. 
In the 1990s, the Republican Party must not adopt the Stephen Douglas position that democracy or states' rights can have the power to deprive individual human beings of their creator-endowed right to life. We must not adopt the Stephen Douglas position that a bad Supreme Court decision is irrevocable or infallible. The Declaration of Independence does not mention slavery. But in the Galesburg, Illinois debate, Lincoln pointed to the clear meaning of the Declaration's words that all of us are endowed with unalienable rights. And he challenged Douglas that, quote, the entire record of the world from the date of the Declaration of Independence up to three years ago may be searched in vain for one single affirmation from one single man that the Negro was not included in the Declaration of Independence, close quote. Likewise, the Declaration of Independence does not mention abortion, but you will search in vain for a single affirmation that the Creator endowed right to life was to be withheld from a baby until the moment of birth. Every new advance in science, especially the DNA and the ultrasound photographs of babies in the womb, confirms the, that the unique individual identity of each of us is present human, alive, and growing before the mother knows she is pregnant. Roe v. Wade, combined with its companion case, Doe v. Bolton, legalized the termination of the unborn baby throughout nine months of pregnancy, and that effectively makes the baby the property of the mother. That proposition is inconsistent with respect for individual human life. Some suggest that we should compromise our traditional Republican principle and diffuse the issue by taking popular positions on subsidiary issues. But a party platform is not a piece of legislation and should not attempt to be. A platform is a standard, a banner to raise on high, to proclaim our general principles and display our convictions. The Republican Party must show virility in its principles. That's what sets us apart from the Democrats. We should be strong on strategic principle while leaving the details and the tactics to the legislative process. The Republican Party, speaking through its platforms adopted at its quadrennial conventions, has in varying language consistently upheld the right to life of unborn babies ever since the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. Unfortunately, the liberal media have used the technique known as false memory syndrome to try to rewrite the history of the 1992 Republican National Convention and November election. The liberal media have even misrepresented the text of the pro-life plank in our platform. It was identical to the plank Bush won on in 1988 and substantially the same as Reagan won on in 1984. The Republican Party is the pro-life party, a position arrived at through the democratic process and maintained consistently through five Republican national conventions. There is no realistic prospect of that changing. Those who want to remove the pro-life position had every opportunity to participate in the 1992 primary and convention caucus process and elect their delegates. But even with ample money and media reinforcement, they failed to make any significant impact on the pro-life convention majority. At the 1992 National Convention, those who wanted to remove the pro-life plank needed only six out of 50 state delegations to precipitate a floor fight on the abortion issue. They were only to get, able to get two out of 50 states. Yet the media clamor persists that the Republican Party should acquiesce in abandoning or at least modifying its pro-life position. To do that would not only be wrong, it would not only be a betrayal of our honorable tradition, but it would be politically stupid. And since in politics, perception is reality, waffling would be perceived as abandonment. It is a fatal mistake for a politician or a party to reverse its position for pragmatic reasons. In 1992, George Bush gave us a bitter lesson in the high cost of reneging on a major campaign promise. The Republican Party cannot afford to repeat the Bush mistake. Even President Clinton has taken a beating from the pro-Clinton media for his foreign policy reversals, even when he should have reversed himself. 
All available data confirm that the pro-life position was a big plus, not a minus, for the Republican Party in the 1992 election. The four major television networks hired voters' research and surveys to do massive exit polls on Election Day, November 3, 1992. These polls confirm the obvious, that the economy, especially the tax increase following the broken read my lips promise, was the reason George Bush lost the election. More importantly, the exit polls also showed that of the 12 percent for whom the issue of abortion decided their vote, 56 percent voted for Bush and only 36 percent for Clinton. That made pro-life a measurable three to five point advantage for Republicans. The pro-life advantage was actually even greater than those figures because another 15 percent of voters told the exit pollsters that family values determined their, their vote. And those people voted for Bush over Clinton by three to one, 66 percent to 23 percent. Some people get down on their knees every night and ask the good Lord to remove abortion from the political sphere. But all the incantations of out damn spot cannot take abortion out of public controversy. It is a national, it is a moral issue because it confronts fundamental issues of right and wrong, of life and death. It is a social issue because it goes to the most deeply held of human relationships and our respect for the worth of our fellow human beings. And it is a political issue because every year dozens of bills about abortion are introduced into the Congress and the state legislatures, and every public official must vote a or nay on those bills. Remembering that the 1996 Republican platform will be written by delegates who will not be elected for two more years, and the 1992 platform is not open to amendment, I offer the following language to be considered as a platform statement. The Republican Party was founded on the principle that no human being should be considered the property of another, and on a repudiation of the Dred Scott decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, which had ruled otherwise. Our first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, relied on our nation's founding document, the Declaration of Independence, for authority to uphold the creator-endowed inalienable right of life and liberty of every individual, and the proposition that government has the duty to protect that right. The Republican Party continues to uphold the principle that every human being, born and unborn, young and old, healthy and disabled, has a fundamental individual right to life. We too rely on the Declaration of Independence for authority in asserting that every individual human being has a creator endowed right to life and that it is the duty of government to protect that life. In the tradition of Abraham Lincoln, we assert that no human being, born or unborn, can be considered the property of another. And we repudiate the Roe versus Wade decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, which held otherwise by presuming to give some individuals the so-called right to terminate the life of others. We reaffirm our support for the appointment of judges who respect the sanctity of human life. We will work to restore the right to life to the class of human beings from whom it has been unjustly taken away. And we oppose all efforts to legitimatize or finance with public revenues the deprivation of that right. Thank you.